Good afternoon, you brave people who are weathering this terrible weather. <laughs> it really isn't very bad, but we're very happy to hear, have you here today. And I'm particularly glad to uh, have the honor of, visit of, of um, um, telling you a little bit about our sleep speaker. I have the privilege this afternoon of welcoming to the Schemmel Forum the new president and dean of Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. As many of you know, the Schemmel Forum has a special relationship with the medical college thanks to its past dean, uh, Dr. Stephen Scheinman. Dr. Scheinman thought that our program, leaning on the humanities side, was an important project for the region and for the medical college. Dr. Byerly shares his interest in Schemmel and brings to us today a subject that will be of great interest to us all. It's about the influence of social de de determinants on human behaviors that promote well-being. Dr. Byerly is a pediatrician whose former clinical practice focused on the care of adolescents, you can imagine that stuff, with fatigue, chronic pain, anxiety, and depression. I'm sure you'll agree that she selected a critically important area for her research. That said, please welcome Dr. Byerly to the podium. Thank you so much, Sandra. It's, it's really a joy and honor to get to be with you today, and I appreciate those of you who are present here. I also recognize and appreciate those who are present in the remote audience and I welcome exchange um, all throughout our time together. So I wanted to talk about something that is of general interest to all of us, and that is the health and well-being of uh, adolescents, young people who become our adults that lead our communities and societies. And I um, want to also think about what we can do collectively to bolster their well-being. And but first, of course, I want to bring you some words about our great medical school and how I ended up here. And so I um, joke a word from my sponsor. I am so fortunate to be serving as the president and dean of Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, just right down the hill there, and um, really uh, am enjoying my time here. I've been here for about nine months. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, my husband Mike is here with me today. We moved into the hill section. We walk through your beautiful campus here at University of Scranton every day with our dog. You will surely see us. Um, and um, we are really enjoying becoming members of your community. What's happened at the school is an inspiring story. Um, some of you know this story even better than I do, but er in the early 2000s, people thought about how this region needed to educate its own physician workforce to attract, retain, and um, build vibrancy around the physician and healthcare community. So in 2009, the first cohort of medical students started at our medical school, and your University of Scranton alum here in the room, Dr. Tom Chirilla, was one of those students. And um, many, his many classmates have turned into being fabulous doctors, many of whom serve in our region, and, and Tom's an example of that. Dr. Chirilla is a radiation <coughs> oncologist in our community, and I'm honored that you would join us today. Thank you for being here. Exactly an example of what we hope our school will accomplish. Um, we started a master's program. We have this beautiful building right down the hall, that, or down the hill, that's been present about a decade or so. We got accredited as a medical school. We have graduated now about 800 doctors. Um, it was very well supported by community physicians um, at the start of the medical school, but as the medical school grew, we really needed a clinical partner to solidify our <coughs> curricular offerings. And it was fabulous for the school that Geisinger partnered with what was then referred to as the Commonwealth Medical College to collectively develop Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, and that became official in 2017. And since then, of course, we've all experienced pandemic and lots of changes in our lives, but where we are now is really exciting that we have the Geisinger College of Health Sciences 
That includes our research enterprise that's all throughout the Geisinger Health System, our medical school curriculum on which we were founded, the master's degree, and then we also have a small nursing program that's based in Lewistown at the Lewistown Hospital that's also come under our umbrella. So a lot of academic growth thanks to the vision of community members in Scranton and the Northeast Pennsylvania area uh, who saw this less than 20 years ago and what it's become is really inspiring. So now we have, as I mentioned, a research institute, an education institute, we've got an academic infrastructure, we have uh, $53 million of funded research in our enterprise and lots of graduate medical education trainees, lots happening under our umbrella. Our mission remains the same. Our mission is to educate aspiring physicians and scientists to serve society. We uphold Geisinger's values. These are the system values, of course, that are inarguable, kindness, excellence, safety, learning, and innovation. And we maintain strong roots and connections with the community. That's how our school was founded. It's why our school was founded, and it is the way that we will continue to be focused. We, of course, want to educate the healthcare workforce of the future. That's what we're all about, is the healthcare workforce. And we partner with many of uh, the programs here at the University of Scranton, for example, nursing, to facilitate that healthcare workforce growth. And again, some of you are even more familiar than I am with all those partnerships, and we're grateful for them. So that's um, an exciting story. The story of community members engaging, seeing a need, coming together for the greater good, and building what in a very short couple of decades has become an academic enterprise, adding value to the community. I found that story incredibly compelling, and that's what attracted me to this position here when Steve Scheinman chose to retire. And so I feel incredibly fortunate to be here and look forward to continuing to advance that vision that was built for and by the community uh, in the early 2000s. I'll transition now to telling you a little bit more about my story and my clinical areas of interest. And I hope as I tell this story, you'll see how it all comes together and it makes sense. And it makes sense that what we're trying to do at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine is really in line with some of the things that I've been personally trying to do in my career with the help and partnership of many others for a long time. We want to build well-being. So I started out as a high school teacher, definitely the hardest job I've ever had. And uh, I found myself wanting to inspire young people into science and working in a ninth grade classroom in a high need setting to do that. I found it incredibly difficult to manage the classroom as many teachers do. I found it very challenging to work in that environment, as many are familiar with, but I loved my adolescence one-on-one. -on -one. And I was trying to teach them, you know, how many electrons go around which particular nucleus and how they bond and so forth like that. Meanwhile, many of them were experiencing threats to their daily health and well-being. Uh, teen pregnancy rates were rampant, HIV was new, we, people like me, working with adolescents, worried that HIV was going to wipe out populations. Uh, obesity was beginning to be on the rise. Some of my students didn't have a bed to put their head in. And I found myself more compelled to address their health care needs. I also found my own skill set better suited to the one-on-one -on -one encounters with patients than it was to that challenging classroom management for which we shall ought to thank all the teachers who continue to succeed in that arena. So I, I left the education environment and went back to undergrad and got my prerequisites for medical school and then became a pediatrician and then along the way really focused on adolescents and got to address some of the adolescent health concerns that I saw in the classroom to begin with and then eventually wound my way through medical education uh, because our medical students are just a little further advanced adolescents. I found myself compelled toward them also. 
And then what I've come to learn as I get older is that all of us are just a little bit of advanced adolescents, actually. And um, I have really enjoyed working with other leaders to become eventually an administrator and end up here at, at Geisinger. So what I hope to do today after sharing that story, the story of our school and the story of my own journey, is to engage and connect with you. That's priority number one to share some of my experience relevant to common and important problems in adolescent health. I do think they're generalizable. I know that all of you who care about university students care about adolescents, and all of us who care about our communities care about how our ad adolescents grow up to be the contributing adults and leaders that we all need. I wanna list some healthy behaviors that mitigate adolescent mental health concerns. Uh, I want to share with you sort of a set of behaviors that I came to really find myself talking about every day in the care of adolescents. And I want you to embrace those and understand how those health behaviors impact health and well-being. But I also hope to highlight the health disparities based on the social determinants because our Health disparities make the way toward well-being for adolescents very challenging for our adolescents in need. And certainly in our region, we have many of those that we would like to bolster. Finally, I want to inspire in each of us a commitment to improve the health and well-being in our community and explore with you inter interventions that might address some of the health determinants that influence these health behaviors and the outcomes for adolescents. I want to make sure that we're all mindful of facilitating behaviors that bolster mental health, not only for our kids, but also for ourselves. And then I hope to generate your enthusiasm about what we're trying to do at our school. So that's what I hope to accomplish today. I also hope to do it in an interactive way. I welcome your interruptions, your questions, your comments, your additions to these thoughts. And I'll leave plenty of time for that at the end, but I never mind a spontaneous interruption either if someone has a comment they might like to share. So I found myself in the adolescent clinic over years seeing these very common problems. Certainly I also cared for problems like of the autoimmune origin, or problems such as the development of cancer or serious infections, that kind of thing. But the truth is, in our adolescent patient population, these common mental health conditions are much more common. Um, anxiety, anxiety was rampant in adolescents prior to the pandemic and then has simply accelerated beyond what we can even fathom. Um, most studies show at least a 25% rate of formal anxiety symptomatology in adolescents, and some studies will show even higher than 25%. But we know all of our adolescents are burdened by symptoms of anxiety, even if they don't meet clinical diagnostic criteria for the disorder. Certainly depression is more common than we would like it to be, that's for sure, and often overlapping and related to anxiety. Um, these anxiety and depression often manifest with pain and chronic pain conditions, often manifest with fatigue, uh, and fatigue is one of the ways that anxiety manifests in, in a more socially acceptable way. If you're too tired to face your anxieties, and you experience fatigue associated with that anxiety, um, that is a common way that adolescents will present. Certainly many people self-medicate their anxiety and depression through the use of substances, and so substance abuse is an important thing to think about in our adolescent patient population. Eating disorders sometimes are a manifestation of these concerns. There are certainly consequences of risky behaviors, risky physical behaviors and risky sexual behaviors that we all are concerned about. And all this is in the context of our adolescents developing their own perceptions of themselves and physically maturing with so many uh, changes that occur as they gain their independence and solidify their self-esteem and envision, hopefully successfully, a future and their role in it. So a lot is happening in that space, and um, certainly if that space is navigated successfully, it bodes well for our communities. How would you rank those in incidents of occurrence? 
Thank you for the question. The question was, um, how would we rate those in incidents of occurrence? Well, I think about the things on the right side of the screen, the perception of self physical maturation, which often for maybe even 100% of adolescents includes some risk taking behavior as they gain independence. That's the baseline biology. And then on the left side, I um, believe anxiety is certainly the most common. Um, I believe most adolescents, especially post pandemic, are experiencing some anxiety. So my list is uh, eating disorders less common, but worthy of attention because of how detrimental and how, how poor the prognosis for eating disorders can be. Oh, excuse me. So I find my, found myself in the clinical environment caring for adolescents talking about these health behaviors to mitigate, mitigate the list of prior concerns that I just shared with you over and over and over again. I was talking with adolescents about how were they caring for their baseline physiology? Were they nourishing their bodies? Were they sleeping and resting and, re and restoring their bodies? Were they exercising to get rid of that anxiety that all of us carry? Uh, were they building healthy relationships? Were they seeing a therapist or pursuing some care for their own personal well-being? And I found myself repeating these conversations so frequently with adolescents, regardless of the chief complaint that led them into the clinical environment, that being a pediatrician and an educator and maybe some somewhat simplistic, I came up with this approach that um, I found myself exercising every day in the care of patients of the five F's. And I think that these five F behaviors, food, fitness, fresh air, fellowship, and friendship with yourself and soul are really health behaviors that improve well-being and address many of the concerns that I'd like to talk about. So as I would, um, with patients, talk about these health behaviors, I found myself challenged by the social realities in which they live. Uh, the social determinants of health for the baseline healthy child and adolescent pop population are the most significant contributors to health and well-being. And the social determinants of health are the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. They are the conditions in which people are born, in which children and young people grow up, in which we all work, live, and age. They're the wider set of forces and systems that shape the conditions of daily life. And they influence our health and well being, especially the health and well being of young people, even more sometimes than our genetics or the biology or uh, the pathogens that we might interface with. So the World Health Organization has put together a diagram that illustrates the social determinants in a little more depth. And I won't go through this completely, except to say that almost everything we can think of uh, impacts the social determinants. Here at the end, um, we t on the right side, the impact on equity in health and well-being is influenced by many factors, including those that the health system provides. But even greater is the impact that you can see um, around the socioeconomic position in which a person sits, their access to education, their occupation, their income that often facilitates their social capital and facilitates their access to health care. And then these things, of course, are influenced by structural factors, such as the macroeconomic policies that influence our cultures uh, and the opportunity of those uh, members of our community to engage across the spectrum. Now, many of you are certainly experts in the social determinants of health, but I wanted to ensure that we were all entering on the same page of understanding what we're talking about and how the economic and governance decisions that are made far removed from the streets on which we work um, actually have very significant impacts on our adolescent health and well-being and therefore our futures. Are you saying that the social determinants are more important than the genetic ones? Well, uh, this is a very good question. The social determinants, are they more important than the genetic ones? 
Honestly, for the population of young people, that's my opinion. Now, measuring the impact, of course, it, there is difficult. Um, we all are influenced heavily by our genetics. But if you think about the young people and the communities in which they grow and the opportunities that influence their health and well-being in the early stages of their lives, the social determinants seem to me to be stronger factors than many of the genetic ones. So the social determinants of health influence not only one, one's baseline health and well-being, the product of a healthy pregnancy starts at a starting line, perhaps further ahead than the product of a challenged pregnancy. We understand that. But also they influence the opportunities that an, individu an individual has to participate in health encouraging behaviors. For example, these are things that we rattle off our tongue all the time in the clinical setting. Well, your weight's more likely to be in a healthy range if you eat fresh fruits and vegetables. Do you have access to fresh fruit and vegetables? I mean, there's a lot of assumption there. Uh, your mood will be better if you exercise daily. Do you have access to that? Uh, what factors influence that? You really need to get a good night's sleep to do well in school. Say that to someone sharing a room with four siblings. Yeah, that's really hard. So there's this an accumulation of impact of the social determinants. Not only do adolescents start in different places based on the social determinants, but then they are influenced, their behavior is influenced further by those same social determinants. And then there is this accumulation of, you know, what I just said is not new news. All adolescents know they're better off if they eat well, sleep well, and exercise well. And then there is this hit on self-efficacy. There's a hit on your self-esteem and confidence if you know what you could be doing and should be doing, but you don't have access to it. So the social determinants not only influence where you start, they influence what you can do with regard to your behavior, and then they influence your mindset about your self-efficacy, about how you can advance your own well-being, about your autonomy. So it's an accumulation of impact that's quite significant. So I want to go back to the five F's and just talk a little bit about those five F's and, and remind you and help you think about some of the social determinants that influence these very common, not controversial behaviors that improve health and well-being. For example, food. We know, and there's evidence to support, that there's an association between poor nutrition and the worsening of mood, mood disorders such as anxiety and depression. Now this actually is an area of active research. The causality is not necessarily determined clearly, but we know that if you're better nourished, your mental health has a chance of being better. We also know that poor diets worsen other health issues that correlate with anxiety and depression. We know that nutrition influences obesity risk. Food scarcity is one of the prime determiners of obesity. That, of course, influences type 2 diabetes risks and many other health conditions. We also know that adolescents who are food insecure eat fewer uh, fruits and vegetables. They're harder to obtain. We know that crowded housing influences healthy food storage and preparation. And we know that publicly provided food, although it may help, it certainly does help, like school provided lunches and so forth like that, it's very difficult to provide fe fresh fruits and vegetables to large school cafeteria populations. We know that. And so the social determinants influence our access to food and influence the quality of our food and influence our health and well-being, and that influences our risk of anxiety and depression. Fitness, the second F, um, has two important components. Our body every day needs rest and restoration and also needs exercise. Sleep, we know, is essential for growth and development, and we know that sleep disruption correlates with nearly all psychiatric and developmental conditions. This is in the milieu of where adolescent sleep is challenged anyway. So adolescents need more sleep than the rest of us. Um, adolescents uh, have a circadian rhythm that doesn't necessarily match our social expectations for them. Many schools have gone to later start times because that matches the physiology of the adolescents. 
It is genuinely physiologically rough on the adolescent to arise every morning at six o'clock and perform well. Uh, their circadian rhythm shifts their day a little later. Um, Many of our adolescents are very busy with uh, the variety of activities that they uh, participate in and that further compromises their sleep. And of course, I don't have to remind everyone that the handheld devices that all of our adolescents are constantly attached to, and most of us are constantly attached to too, also compromise our sleep. And so one of the first questions I always ask an adolescent about sleep is, do you sleep with your phone? They all say, of course. Um, and then you say, do you at least silence the phone that you sleep with? And maybe or maybe not, you know. Uh, but obviously our, our sleep is challenged. And then here on the bottom you can see that um, developmentally appropriate sleep correlates with intellectual ability. It also, um, emotional regulation, people who have not slept well, who are challenged with emotional regulation or even have their intellect challenged, of course, participate in uh, risk-taking behaviors to a greater extent. I mean, I think all of us can think about our own when you're sleep deprived, you might not behave as well as when you are better rested. Um, and that's, of course, true for our adolescents. And then uh, it influences their learning in the classroom. And so again, thinking about adolescent well-being, we want them eating well, we want them sleeping well, and when they're in a challenging social setting, that's difficult to accomplish. I've already mentioned having multiple roommates as a challenge, um, uncomfortable temperatures as a challenge if uh, you're not in safe and secure housing, um, irregular work sh shifts that might influence the adolescent, him or herself, or also the adults coming and going from the household, background noise that influences the quality of sleep, and a list of other uh, things that might influence an adolescent's access to sleep is uh, another way that social determinants influence their health and well-being. So similarly, we have challenges to exercise. Um, but we know that exercise is good for us, and the evidence supports that vis vigorous aerobic exercise for 45 to 60 minutes confers benefits to youth physical and mental wellness. One of the things that I always, um, I actually think the evidence supports this, but um, whether it does or not, it is helpful in communication with adolescents and adults. You know, anxiety leaves the body, I say lightly, as sweat, tears, or blood. Um, blood, sweat, or tears. And uh, sweat is by far the least painful. Um, but if we don't lose the anxiety uh, through sweat, um, there's a decent chance it will make us very sad. And of course, there's a chance that we will feel sicker um, with anxiety. And I think uh, exercise decreasing adolescent and adult anxiety is well proven. Um, of course, there are additional social benefits to sports participation. And um, there's a lot of evidence that participation in physical activity can improve adolescents' mental health. And one of the factors um, is additionally psychologic, that self-perception and enhanced self-esteem comes from participation in exercise as well. That's one of the correlates. But there is a lot of interest, of course, in physiologic direct benefit as well. So, I think it's relatively inarguable that exercise would be good for adolescents, and um, it's again challenged by the social determinants. Uh, you know, many of our uh, kids participate in lessons from coaches, travel teams that are expensive, uh, uniform demanding activities for their exercise. Um, many of the facilities in which our kids exercise um, demand additional fees and that kind of thing. And then our busy kids that might be juggling jobs and so forth, um, or trying to accommodate other expectations in their family, babysitting siblings, that kind of thing, have more challenges getting to exercise. So again, that compounded impact. Easy to say, exercise to get rid of your anxiety, recognizing that not everybody has the same access to exercise. Fresh air. This is a growing area of interest about how access to nature improves mental health and well-being. But we know that um, there are protective effects on mental health outcomes and cognitive function 
uh, for um, there's early correlation that time outside um, improves likelihood of physical activity, improves sleep, um, and improves um, some of the other physiologic markers of health, such as uh, blood pressure. We also know that vitamin D is obtained by sunlight of exposure. Vitamin D is also obtained by supplement or some foods. But vitamin D through sunlight exposure uh, is important, and deficiency of vitamin D correlates uh, with depression. And we know that in adolescence, especially, uh, depression is ameliorated to a certain extent by vitamin D supplementation. And um, we want our adolescents to spend time outside. There are other social benefits as well. I'll just tell you quickly a sweet story. Um, I uh, had one patient, a teenage boy, who was experiencing a lot of fatigue. His fatigue likely was um, due to his depression that he had not fully recognized yet. And um, that was leading to isolation, leading to a lot of time on his couch in front of the TV. And I prescribed for him the five F's, and he really embraced that he was going to try the five F's. And, and his mother also embraced this. And then when they returned for a follow-up visit um, two weeks later, <laughs> she said, I was running the list of how's he doing with food, how's he doing with fitness, how's he doing with fresh air. And he shared with me a sweet story that, well, my mom did make me go sit outside. I said, yes, and what happened? And he said, well, I sat outside in the front yard, and I felt really stupid. I was like, okay, uh, but you're sitting outside in the front yard, and then what happened? And he said, well, my neighbor invited me to play basketball. And I was like, and how'd that go? He said, we've been playing basketball. I was like, okay, I'll take that as a win. And that didn't have to do with his vitamin D level, but it did have other benefits of um, you know, encouraging outdoor exposure, which of course allows kids to um, find lots of other um, ways to avoid isolation. So, uh, and ways to avoid isolation is a good thing. And um, when I was exploring the evidence on fresh air, and is fresh air good for us, I came across this study um, from 2019. It was performed in England and Wales, and um, it uh, was fascinating to me because they had 3,000 adolescents that they followed um, correlating their anxiety symptoms to their outdoor exposure. And they looked at additional factors as well. And one of the factors that they looked at, because many people, of course, say, well, I can't go be outside because my neighborhood's not safe which is, of course, a social determinant. Do you feel, are you safe in your neighborhood? The fascinating result of this study was it was more about did they perceive themselves to be safe than what the crime rates in the neighborhood actually were. So young people, adolescents, that perceived that their community was a safe place to be went outside more and that correlated with better scores on their own self-assessment of their mental health. Underlying data showed that crime rates were sometimes high or higher in the environments where they perceived themselves to be safe than in places where adolescents perceived themselves to not be safe. But the key there was perception. And so um, I find this to be an important take-home point that um, I mean, it's complicated. We want our adolescents outside in places that are safe. Of course we do. But whether those places are safe or not, we want our adolescents to feel safe. And we especially want our adolescents to feel safe in places that are safe. And, you know, anxiety is all about fear. And the more that we encourage fear of outside or fear of being in the community, uh, the more our adolescents will isolate themselves and avoid outside activity and anxiety rates will increase. Of course, there are many social determinants there. Um, lack of access to parks and gardens is something that we talk about frequently about how to improve our neighborhoods and lack of exposure to organized activities that are outside, um, that is one of the social determinants as well. 
The fourth F is about fellowship with peers. Um, we know that social interaction meets a basic human need. We know that loneliness and isolation worsen anxiety. It's, a, it's cyclically reinforcing in that the, if you isolate yourself because you feel anxious, the more isolated you are, the more your anxiety will increase when you are forced to have social interaction. So it is a vicious cycle that has to be broken. Um, and the way to break that, I'm afraid of social interaction, therefore I isolate, and that makes me more afraid of social interaction, therefore I isolate. The way to break that cycle is forced social interaction. And thus, you know, many of the adolescents that I would um, see in my clinical practice would ask for permission to be homebound for their education. Almost never would I grant homebound education. And the rationale was, you know, students would say, well, she's making straight A's without going to school. She doesn't need to go to school. Uh, making straight A's is really not what school's all about. Um, school is about fellowship with your peers in addition to learning. And so um, I'm obviously a big fan of going to school um, or having other ways that you socially interact with peers. Um, and, of course, there's social determinants of health that influence that as well. Finally, um, to make therapy fit in my algorithm that had four other Fs, I call it friendship with yourself and soul. <laughs> and I do think that there's something to friendship with yourself and soul being um, about therapy. And we know that psychotherapy um, can be effective and certainly is useful with adolescents as they envision their future and so forth. Um, also other wellness activities I would fit under this umbrella of friendship with yourself and soul, certainly spiritual support, certainly um, mindfulness activities and so forth. But it's real easy to say, yeah, take a yoga class and then when that yoga class costs $20, is that really accessible um, to all the adolescents? And obviously there are other factors as well. So back to the five Fs, um, uh, I think that those health behaviors, really important to adolescents, really important actually to all of us, and that as a community, we should make them available to each of us. And so what I hope that you'll think about, and we'd like to think about this at the medical school as well, is you know, what we can and must do to facilitate these healthy behaviors. This isn't rocket science. Uh, this is simple health encouraging behaviors. Um, ensuring healthy food availability, secure housing and environmental attention that, that bolster see, say, excuse me, sleep and a perception of safety. Um, uh, we need safe neighborhoods. We also need our, our people to feel safe in our neighborhoods. Uh, if we can enable young people to participate in teams, that addresses two of the Fs, the fitness and the fellowship. If we can create safe spaces and ensure that people feel safe in them, that can facilitate both fresh air and fitness. If we can facilitate peer relationships and ensure that our schools are strong and have robust extracurriculars available without cost, where healthy social relationships are cultivated, there are just so many gains for all of us associated with that. And then to facilitate that therapeutic part, we need a lot of work to bolster our mental health resources. Uh, we need therapists available for our young people, not only trained therapists that work in our health professional workforce, but it has to be accessible, um, accessible with regard to cost and availability for our young people. And so I hope that we together as community leaders will build those social supports and will build an infrastructure that allows our teens uh, and young people to focus on healthy development rather than simply avoiding the toxic stressors that they face. So back to my sponsor, because this is what we're trying to do at the medical school for sure. We are trying to influence our community in, by the production of a health profession workforce and by influencing our community to have healthier behaviors and accessibility for all our members that way. So I'll just very quickly tell you um, some outcomes to be proud of. We have 853 graduates of our medical school. Um, that's 853 new doctors, many of whom are still in residency or fellowship training, but greater than 30% of them are practicing in Pennsylvania, 35 are in the Geisinger footprint, and 22 are in northeastern Pennsylvania. And that's great thanks to the vision of those of you that participated in, this, in the school's founding, so thank you for that. Um, we've got students learning of all types at all levels in partnerships with all kinds of higher education um, partners. 
over 5,000 learners a year come through the Geisinger system. Not all of them are in our formally um, uh, in our formal education programs in our umbrella. Certainly, many of them are at other uh, institutions of higher ed. Many of the nursing students are here, for example. Um, but we have lots of partnerships that facilitate that many learners in the clinical machine of Geisinger. And that's really exciting as you think about our future. We know from the evidence what generates a health profession workforce committed to the area. And this is the evidence that we embrace. We know that we should preferentially select learners from the area of need. So our area of need is Northeastern Pennsylvania and learners who grew up or were educated or have family ties here in our area get preferentially treated through our admissions process. We do that. We train the learners in this area. We hope that while they're training, they'll grow roots and want to stay. We provide community engagement during that training. All of our students participate in a community engagement project so that they get to know the community outside the walls of the institution. And we enhance the curriculum to be focused on the needs of the local community. And then we celebrate that cohort with pride. Um, we say, when our students are staying here in the area for residency, or when they're opening their practice here in the area or joining a practice here in the area more commonly, um, we celebrate that. That's what we want to inspire. And then we also are working to eliminate their debt. The Abigail Geisinger Scholars Program eliminates debt for many of our medical students who commit to serve in the region. It's a forgivable loan program that covers all tuition and fees for our medical students, which is nearly $350,000, it's a lot. And in exchange for that forgivable loan, they have to promise to work for the Geisinger system. But that loan is underwritten by Geisinger. It's an investment that Geisinger is making into the future workforce. And so 40 of our medical students uh, who commit to primary care jobs for Geisinger and five of our medical students who commit for psychiatry jobs for Geisinger, out of every class, 45 doctors can be fully funded by uh, the system. It, but they have to commit to serving here after their training time is done. Um, this program's just growing, but it's transformative for our region. Um, and if you think into the future, about 45 new docs a year working in the Geisinger footprint who graduated from our medical school. I mean, I just can't wait to see it. I think it's so exciting. So our aspiration at our school is uh, to be a nationally recognized academic enterprise that serves our region through inspiration, innovation, discovery, and workforce development. We want our academic enterprise at Geisinger College of Health Sciences to be a magnet that brings in vibrant faculty, staff, and learners into our community. We want to teach them what our community needs. We want to address today's problems and prepare for tomorrow's healthcare challenges. We want to leverage direct needs of our system and our people. If our people are in need of care in an area, we want to educate to that area of need and we want to advance value-based care that is accountable to the community. And um, I know that it's cliche, it's our tagline, it's on our billboards, that kind of thing. But making better health easier is what we want to be, an academic asset that makes better health easier, not only for our patients that we individually serve, but of course for the region that we're thankful to be a part of. So I'll stop there and welcome your comments or questions either about our school or adolescents or anything. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have a couple questions. The first is kids seem to be maturing so much earlier. When you talk about adolescents, are you including 10 and 11? Are you including 10 and 11 year olds? Thank you for the question. So the question was kids are maturing so much earlier and you're right, there's concrete evidence for that. Puberty is happening earlier. Younger girls are menstruating earlier that we know concretely that to be true. You're exactly right. Additionally, there are all the influences on um, maturation from social media and other sources uh, that uh, are about their psychologic development, of course. And so I purposely didn't define adolescence with an age range. Um, I personally think of adolescence starting in late elementary school years and continuing through, well, forever. But um, you're, you're right that, uh, 
our kids grow up fast. Yep. Uh, I want to thank you for that presentation okay. and for the focus on on this end of the life, life cycle spectrum, because obviously it's important to, to go on there, and, and you're obviously very passionate about this. Um, however, I have a different question. Sure. Uh, given the demographics of this region, the demographics of Pennsylvania, the demographics of this room, mm -hmm. it always befuddled me as to why there hasn't been an emphasis, particularly here, on the other end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. the aging problems. It seems like it would be a natural laboratory for these things, mm -hmm. and I haven't seen that develop. So uh, is there some plan to do that, or is there, or is this, you've, your plate is full enough doing, doing what you're doing? No, I so appreciate the question. Thank you for that. And I do believe that we, as a collective enterprise, the academic environment at Geisinger, is absolutely thinking about how to care for the uh, older adult. And there are a lot of things that we're doing to that end. One is the 65 Forward program, um, which is really amazing. Uh, primary care practices that are built with low numbers of patients per doctor, um, focused toward wellness and preventive care, and um, serving a patient population that's only 65 or older. Um, and in that milieu, there also is access to, you know, the food pharmacy, teaching cla uh, cooking classes, classes about chronic disease management, and classes about healthy exercise for elderly adults and so forth. Um, I chose to talk about adolescence because of my own personal um, experience and expertise um, in my career as a pediatrician. I think our uh, enterprise is very focused on the care of um, older adults. However, I think our community needs to do both concurrently. We absolutely have to care for the demographics that we serve, the elderly and adult population. Um, but we have to attract and support young people too, um, or that challenge will only get harder. And I'm, you know, I'm looking over your shoulder, Dr. Chirilla, who's raising little kids in this area, and I want to make sure that people like him also are well supported in their family growth. And so I think that it's a both and. Of course, we absolutely need to care for the population that we serve, and we need to do it in a way that brings in um, a vibrant young workforce that's being um, trained to do that. Oh, thank you for the question about research. Yes, um, I think you're right that there's a lot we can do in research. I'm sure that some is happening, and I can't point to it specifically. Uh, but that's a very fair question. Okay. Um, my question is about the medical school and what connections you have with the minority community here. Thank you. Um, we're working to diversify our school for sure. And um, not only does that include our student body, which is much more diverse actually than the community, and um, but also our faculty. We would really like to recruit a more diverse faculty. Um, we have a uh, vice dean coming in for health equity and inclusion. She will absolutely be advancing um, efforts in diversity. Um, there's a long track record of focused effort in that space at our school um, also. And um, our student body is um, diverse in many ways, not only more diverse racially than the baseline community, but also we have about 21% of our student body is first generation. Uh -huh. So that is also helping to diversify uh, the cohort of future doctors. Um, we have a curriculum that's robust about how to ensure that all of our graduates can care for diverse communities, uh, but we definitely have work to do to recruit um, the diversity of presence among our community members uh, within the school that I'd like to. Okay, well, I mean, what connections in the community do you have? T tell me some examples. What are you thinking of? Okay, I'm thinking of Black Scranton, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is trying to talk about health and well-being, I think. Uh, they're starting a chapter, or be, there was the beginning of a chapter of NAACP, and there's going to be a health fair with Geisinger at the end of the month. Great. And we're in a low-income area, you know, west side. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't know with that kind of thing if, if you got your, some of your students involved with it. Thank you. Um, yes, for example, at the Juneteenth celebration, our students were present, or not all of them, of course, but yeah. some of them were present and involved. 
Um, we, the diversity efforts through the Geisinger system are aligned with the diversity efforts of our school. When there are diversity events in the system, our students are encouraged to attend and vice versa. Um, our students lead some diversity events and welcome uh, the participants of the health enterprise as well. So, and Black Sprinton is absolutely one of those connections. So, thank you. Good. Excuse me. I was impressed with your uh, identifying the Abigail of Geisinger scholarships, but I want to go beyond that and ask that we all know that there is a movement among physicians in this country into corporate enterprise and away from a more responsible relationship with patients and an diminishing um, relationship with them. What is going on in medical education and particularly in Geisinger to encourage physicians, uh, aspiring physicians, to remain uh, more committed to that patient-doctor relationship yes. and out of the corporate experience? Thank you. So um, some of the things that we're doing are starting out our students early in their first year with uh, standardized patients, actor patients. Some of you may serve as actor patients for us. If you do, thank you. Um, but our students uh, get direct feedback on their communication skills and their bedside manner uh, from year one from the uh, actors who um, serve as patients with a variety of different complaints and give feedback immediately after the encounter to our students. Uh, we, uh, we talk a lot about the importance of compassion um, and how we as providers um, need to ensure that we demonstrate our compassion and sustain our compassion. Because every single one of our medical students that comes in the door wants to make the world a better place by caring for people. Every single one of them does. And then what happens is that um, some of them, as they experience stressors um, and the demands of their work at various phases of their career, will experience more and more burnout. So preventing that burnout and mitigating that burnout when it arises are other areas of focus in our education because we don't have to teach them to care. They start by caring. And what we have to do is help them maintain that caring. Um, so we give them feedback on their skills. We try to give them personally skills that will help them maintain that caring perspective. And then with regard to the corporate pieces, I think all of us in the machine of medicine are concerned about the point that you're raising, that there's a trend for medicine to feel less compassionate. We all are concerned about that. And so there's a balance of um, making sure that we tend to safety, tend to organized and predictable systematic care that sometimes feels very corporate, but does sometimes correlate with some good outcomes, and at the same time main that, maintain that personal relationship, that personal protective care direct get to know you relationship piece that I know that you think is so important. And balancing that is, is it's challenging, um, but it is something for that we're striving to do. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, thanks, Tom. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk, Dr. Byerly. Thank you. And I appreciate particularly how pragmatic the five Fs were. Um, my question for you is if you had any thoughts about the impact of social media use in adolescents, particularly as it relates to some of those five Fs. You know, it's interesting because I grew up in a generation where Facebook was just being introduced when we were in college. So kind of, you know, the adolescents, early teen years really had no exposure to social media. And you know now I feel that uh, people are using it at earlier and earlier ages, and it seems like it's changing some of the interactions. You know, sometimes I think many of us have experienced. You'll see uh, younger people kind of prefer to interact with their phone instead of face-to-face -face interactions. Maybe prefer screen time instead of getting out. So, any thoughts about you know how maybe to mitigate that or kind of change the tide? You know, if you feel it's even necessary. Well, I wish that I had all the answers to that, and um, of course. I think the human relationship, direct eye contact is still, is forever, not still, but forever, 
really important. And I think that all that we can accomplish virtually is great. I'm trying to make eye contact with the camera. I hope people feel that I'm making eye contact, but I don't know who's on the other side of the screen. It's not real eye contact. And so that face-to-face -to -face touch, uh, that face-to-face -face real eye contact, that touch um, is so important for human development. And I do worry about our young people about that. At the same time, they are savvy about making the world a small place where they can interact with people all over the world, where they can learn more and so forth. And, and, and on my most optimistic days, um, I hope that they'll lead us to be good citizens through the use of the benefits of those connections because they're not going away. I mean, we're, we are not going to get to the point where fewer devices are available. I'm sure of that. And um, so I think what we have to do is, is protect our humanity while we utilize those things in the best way. And I welcome everybody else's ideas on that because I'm sure this is a place where we all have opinions. Yes. Am, am I next? Or, oh. <clears throat> you threw me off base when you uh, spoke of eye contact. Uh, that's a subject that uh, I've spoken about before, and I think we have to look at it again. In the Asian community, uh, as you well know, um, they avert eye contact for whatever reason. In the black community, um, you're taught that uh, you don't look, if I'm correcting you, don't you dare look me in the eye ever. And that carries over into adulthood. I've told students, however, that uh, if you're looking for a job, then you look the person directly in the eye and they, at that point, they think you're honest and all of that. But uh, that's what I want, I didn't want to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> but thank you for sharing that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I wanted to talk about was uh, uh, fitness. Um, and I'm wondering if you will stress the, the caveats of fitness too. And I'm thinking specifically of football yeah. and young people. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there are a number of other things too. Yeah, so I assume you're making reference to the brain injury risk that occurs with football and the social disparities that occur in that too. Uh, I mean, some of the... And soccer, absolutely, with uh, the risk of brain injury, yes. Um, that I believe, um, if I'm understanding the situation correctly in soccer, it comes just as much from falls as from heading the ball and um, is a, a real concern and a real risk. Um, the football debate is one that we may not have enough time for. Um, it's a complicated question because uh, there are so many benefits that do come to our society at large um, about participation in um, team-oriented behavior. And we could pull any sport for that. Uh, but joining together and finding a shared focus, shared support, that can be good for relationship building. It should never be at the expense of those participating on the field. And I worry about that a lot in football, especially with the social disparities with regard to who tends to participate in football. And, and you know, football it allows for big teams, allows for a lot of kids to participate. Um, soccer to a certain extent as well. Um, soccer is a very inexpensive sport, um, allows a lot of participation celebrated around the world. Um, how to make it safe is a question and uh, a, a challenge. Um, I, I wish I had answers to those questions. I thought that you also might be going in the direction of the excessive competitiveness and the focus that a lot of our young people have on only one sport and the early specialization in sports. I mean, absolutely any of the health behaviors taken to the extreme can end up not being good for us. Um, uh, and I, it, so I would say, you know, that the classic line of everything in moderation. Um, but the brain injury in football is something that, and soccer and other sports is something we're learning more and more about. And we absolutely should be protecting our brains. Um, how to do that and encourage the team building and the healthy physical activity is, is a little bit challenging. Um, well, um, you know, I'm passionate about citizenship, and I feel that um, that's not just a uh, voting, but except I hope everyone here is going to be voting, I'm wearing that button. But um, the feeling uh, of the feeling about others, I think that it's um, 
uh, I should say, a healthy. Uh, it's good to have friends. It's good to have uh, exercise. It's good to have um, the those things, um, good meals. But there's something uh, human, an important human um, capacity for uh, caring about others. Healthy. I agree with you 100%. It is important to care for others. Um, and also to be an engaged citizenry. I uh, thank you for that. Thanks, Julie. Thank um, I have a question. Um, Kevin and I have four grandchildren, all boys. I am, I am worried about adolescents. They range from 10 years old to 17. They've gone through two to three years of isolation. They have. And they are, I shouldn't have to worry about them, according to, you know, anything that you've put on the screen today, they have, they're in, you know, adequate, they are getting adequate uh, food, they live in wonderful places, they have friends, they, they, their parents have tried to keep them connected, all of that, and they're still, there's that gap. I don't know what we can do, but I'd love to know what we can do, and especially because they're boys. I mean, lately there have been a couple of books, and I've got one that just came <laughs> yesterday, about how to help boys become men, because they, are, they seem to be having a problem uh, growing up with a, a, a good vision of manliness. And it said that, you know, women have had the chance, because of fighting for equality and the women's movement, to, to have 50 years of talking to one another about femininity. But there isn't a lot that's talked about masculinity. And so I worry about adolescents and I worry what we can do as individuals, as a society. How can we help make up for the isolation that they've all gone through and it's affecting them in one way, shape, or form? I, I'm, our older, our oldest grandson is applying to colleges. It's a very anxious time, but he's a you know really laid back kind of guy. But a month ago on Zoom, I saw him go into an anxiety attack in front of me. And if he's going through that with all the kinds of support that he has, what can we do for those who don't? I mean, except try and get them out of it, but I don't know how to do that either. <laughs> right. I think what you just shared um, is illustration of how much we all care about this. Um, it affects the people that we know and love, regardless of their social resources, um, that we, care, we, we just so, like, I, I joke sometimes with the adolescents that I just want to sprinkle some self-esteem all over the place um, <laughs> if we could. And uh, the... Um, I think the fact that we are having these conversations, that you as a grandmother are having these conversations with your grandson, more power to you. Um, the way that we can um, help young people recognize their own development and um, see themselves in the future is if we help them to process their own development. And a lot of times that comes through conversation, through acknowledgement that these are hard times. This is been really challenging. Um, I'm not sure that we've dealt with all the trauma of the isolation of the last few years, and I do think that forever uh, the generations will remember sort of where they were in 2020, 2021, and, and what part of their life it influenced. And um, yes, uh, academically we know, for example, that the cohort that was in sixth grade in 2020, 2021 um, was it, Everybody fell behind academically. That sixth grade cohort fell behind the most. And so how are we going to help them uh, catch up? Um, and I think certainly through conversation is one of the many ways that we should be working. But thanks for sharing your, your heart about it. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. You, can tell, you can tell that people were listening because they're 
there's so many questions. Well, thank you. Thank you and very good much. answers. Thank you. Um, David, thank you.